My name is Joel, and I'm going to be talking to you about Hydra, an open source document processing framework. I'm glad you all could make it. Uh, I know it's right before lunch, so if you're kind of low on blood sugar and you're kind of confused about what talk this was going to be, this is Hydra. Uh, if you're meant to be somewhere else, just embrace it, enjoy, relax. Uh, obviously, it's fate that you're here instead. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our company because it kind of sets the tone uh, for why we want to do Hydra. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about Hydra and how that relates to all of the fun stuff you've been hearing about all the rest of this conference. Uh, so FindWise is, uh, that's the, the cheat sheet over there. We're the largest uh, search solution provider in Europe uh, with about 70 uh, search consultants, um, 82 employees in total. Um, it's kind of, we have a, a bunch of different customers basically. Um, do consultancy mainly. Um, and we're technology independent, which means that we work with uh, a multitude of search platforms, not just the fun ones uh, you might have heard of, like Elasticsearch and Apache Solar and Lucene, uh, but also uh, less fun ones. I'm not going to name them, uh, um, but, but they're, they're over there. Um, but that's an important thing to remember when we're talking about document processing and what we're trying to accomplish is that we do a multitude of projects using different search engines, which means that as much as possible, we want to rely on the search engine for doing search, and as much as possible, rely on other things for doing the things around it. Because that avoids vendor locking and it avoids uh, us having to have competency in multitude of platforms and, and other things. Uh, so, so that's an important thing to remember. So the generic search architecture that we usually uh, show is, is this one. Uh, it's fairly simple. Uh, there's content at the far end. Uh, how many here has actually implemented a search solution before I continue? Excellent. It's uh, nice to be among peers. Um, so there's content on the left, and then something happens to get the content out of the system where it resides. Uh, sometimes you have the luxury of creating the content right before it enters the search engine. A lot of the times in our projects, we come in to do, say, enterprise search or intranet search for a company or even you know, product search in a product database or whatever. Um, the content already lives in a system. Uh, we just need to make the search. Um, so you have to extract the content first, and then you usually have a connector. Um, Today, there are a number of open source alternatives for connectors to m many popular systems, uh, such as uh, Manifold CF. I think they're making uh, Apache top-level status uh, right about now. Um, and uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of other connector frameworks you can use. Um, when I started, um, when I did my first content extraction for search, uh, I didn't know it was called uh, you know, connectors or whatever. I just had a Python script. Uh, and I just uh, pulled uh, data out of a SQL database. And then in line, I did a bunch of different transformations and uh, lookups for different things uh, in just one big, long Python script, and then I put it into the search engine. Uh, I don't know how many have, of you have gone through this process, but usually you want to do something to transform the data, right? Um, to make it search index nice. Um, in this picture, we also have uh, the user. Uh, I, I generally tend to uh, ignore him um, as much as possible. Um, but we have, in this case, the, the search box. But it, of course, you can have a search-driven application instead. And we usually have some middle layer between the search index and, uh, and the actual application. So for the search index, remember there can be a bunch of different engines. Um, I primarily work with Elasticsearch and Solar. Um, but it could be something else. So what do you want to do when you connect the source to the search? Well, oftentimes when we come to companies, um, they have this huge archive of uh, PDF files that they've generated. Or um, they want to have, um, what, do you call it? what do you call it? Um, they want to monitor the news for information about their business, or they want to do whatever it might be. Um, so you have to extract the data and make it searchable in a nice way. Um, so we all know that garbage in gar equals garbage out. Uh, but what about unstructured data in? Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever done web crawling, but web crawling 
when you do HTML, you think it's the most structured thing in all of existence, but when you actually try to parse it, it's the worst thing that's ever happened. It all looks totally flat and garbled and strange. Um, so, for instance, if you want to do, say you want to have search for, uh, for news about your company, um, and you want to index a bunch of different news outlets, say CNN.com, NewYorkTimes.com, uh, you end up crawling them, uh, and you end up with a news article, which is, by definition, unstructured data, right? Because there's no real structure around it. Uh, you just end up with a plain text. Um, but in fact, you usually, usually find things hidden in there uh, that it's highly structured, um, such as the title. It's uh, obviously more important for search. It's better for your relevancy. Um, the author byline might be just at the end of the article, the last little thing that's on it, the on its line on its own says the author name. You can find this on CNN.com or NewYorkTimes.com. They actually don't have any metadata around this. Uh, it's just a, a piece, of, a line of text. Uh, so you have to obviously extract this somehow so that you can do searching on, say if you want to search for an author on CNN.com, you need to be able to have that as an indexed field, obviously, in your search solution. Uh, and then obviously you might want to do other things like extract the lead paragraph because that's going to be more important for your relevancy model than the actual content text. Um, so what else can you do uh, when you are uh, doing enrichment and uh, structuring? Well, we usually do things like uh, language detection um, because with multinational companies you often end up with uh, a multitude of different languages being used. Uh, and perhaps if you're in Sweden, you don't want to search on uh, content in Russian. Uh, or if maybe you want to search on it, but you wouldn't be able to understand it anyway. So it's, it's nice to be able to filter that out. Um, you can also do more complex things like sentiment analysis, figure out if it's a positive or negative article. So you can filter on good articles about your company or bad articles about your company. Um, and you can also do uh, other things like headline extraction. I think one of the most interesting things when talking about document enrichment and meta metadata uh, extraction is that people always focus on the heavy NLP stuff like uh, sentiment analysis or entity extraction or whatever it might be. Uh, usually what, what you really need to do is do some regular expressions to get whatever's the important business logic in, in, in the piece of data that you have. Um, for instance, you might have um, a word template at your company, uh, and the author metadata on the Word document says that all of the documents ever created at your company were authored by the secretary of the CEO. Um, this happens more often than you think, because that person wrote the template. Um, but on the other hand, you know that the, f the very at the very top, in the right-hand corner, everyone writes their name, because that's the, the company standard for, uh, for Word documents. Um, so more often than not, you just need to do... Sorry about that. Did, it, did I break it? No? Okay. I'll just turn it gently away. Yeah, okay. Um, so more often than not, you just need to do regular expression matching. Uh, perhaps you have... Uh, the best use case is if you have uh, a file server that you want to have searchable for everyone at your company, which is a pretty common use case. Um, all right. Uh, freestyling. Yes, excellent. Um, so if you want to index your file server, perhaps you've already put a huge amount of man hours into creating that folder structure that made it findable in the first place. Uh, you have all of the department's documents in one place and all of the projects under that department in the next level of the tree and then so on and so forth. So usually you just want to extract some stuff out of the document path. Um, so that's important to remember that it's not just the heavy stuff, it's also very mundane stuff that you want to do. Um, but you can also, you know, collect statistics, export to staging environments, and uh, filter out unwanted documents, that sort of thing. So how do we usually do this? Well, uh, this is what's called a pipeline. 
So if you recall, we had, um, sorry if I'm drifting in and out. Um, if you recall, we had the connector to the left in the That's usually where the pipeline comes in. That's where you do your document management. Um, this is usually a sequence of steps that there's a open pipeline is one of them. Uh, Xproc, um, whatever Python uh, linear script you you want to write, you can do that. Um, we usually use open pipeline. Uh, or we used to, uh, for for our projects, because that allowed us to have um, a code base we could work on and have a bunch of different steps that we could just configure into our solutions. Um, so one of these stages might do uh, PDF parsing, and one of these stages might do uh, entity extraction or whatever. Uh, on the other hand, uh, this is a problem, right? Because we have a little cloud, right? And then we have the not so fluffy little cloud around the, the, the pipeline, because um, none of these solutions that exist on the market today actually scale for this use case. Um, so we needed to do something. Uh, also, a lot of these, a lot of times, these steps don't actually depend on each other to do what they need to do. Uh, and one regular expression. Uh, stage that extracts some data does not depend on any other regular expression stages. They all work on the same data. So why would you need to have that sequential? Um, so that's also one of the problems. And maybe you want to do something with PDF documents, something else with Word documents. You can't really do forks. Um, so this is the most pressing problem, though. With Open Pipeline, I don't know, has anyone here used Open Pipeline? No, excellent. Good for you. Um, there's a the the huge problem of uh, Tika, the PDF parser or the the binary. Has anyone used uh, Tika? Yeah, some some people. Excellent. Um, so uh, Tika previously had a bunch of problems with corrupt PDF files. If you happen to stumble across a corrupt PDF file, Tika would go into a, uh, a never-ending loop. Uh, consume all of the heap space on your virtual machine uh, and then crash. So what happens if we use a pipeline that is a uh, business uh, value generating thing is it, it would all just come to a grinding halt. Uh, so that's also one of the problems. You can't really cope with failure in, in a straight pipeline like this. So that's why we designed Hydra. Uh, so this was the general goal of, of Hydra is that you will get your documents in from the left uh, in the slide. Uh, it will enter sort of a processing cloud where stages may be performed uh, in any order or in uh, sequence, depending on uh, the requirements they have. Uh, so maybe for some stages would need to be happening after the PDF extraction. Some would be, uh, could be happening at any time. Uh, and then enter the, the search index. That's the, the general idea. So the main design objectives of Hydra uh, are for scalability. Um, we wanted Hydra to be as scalable as possible. And when you're talking about scale at this conference, uh, or at, least at, at any conference when you're talking about scale, people just think large scale. Uh, we also want small scale. Uh, because we want to be able to bring this out to all of our customers. Uh, so we want something that scales from the very small to the very big. Um, we want to have the ability to add new machines to the cluster, the processing cluster, uh, independently of each other. We don't want them to have to know of each other or do anything like that. Um, we want it to be failure tolerant. We don't want to have the case where uh, one crashed JVM brings down the entire system, or whatever might, might be the case. So uh, the failure of one single stage should only affect that document that it failed on, and it should be able to be automatically restarted and start doing work on something else. Um, and I think the most important one is, is the last one, uh, development ease. Uh, we wanted Hydra to be easy to work with. <coughs> 
We want it to be as easy as humanly possible to write in processing stages. Because the processing stage is really just that. It's a simple one method thing uh, that you just want to be able to put in order or configure in different ways to do different things. But it's just really just one simple thing. So we want that to be as easy as possible. And something we noticed a lot is that you start out making your entire pipeline, you start it, and then suddenly there's a new format of document that comes in, or uh, the requirements change, maybe the uh, content management team decide that, oh, we want to have this type of uh, object now in the system, or whatever. Um, you want your pipeline to be able to be developed in a test-driven way, which is to say that all documents, to go back to this slide, all documents that entered from the left, um, will eventually reach the search index as soon as you've configured the cloud to properly do it for them. So a PDF document might go through, but you don't, you don't have a fork for the Word document. Uh, so you can just fix that. And uh, that would automatically uh, output it whenever the time came that you actually managed to do this. Because then you can end up in a situation where you have, you can easily see if your uh, pipeline manages all documents or not. So, Hydra is designed around MongoDB currently. Um, that might, might change in the future. Right now we're happy with MongoDB. Um, so Hydra is basically just the core application there, uh, which connects to MongoDB and actually reads all of the processing stages from MongoDB. Um, so core only knows the, the location of the MongoDB central repository. Um, and what pipeline it's supposed to be running. Um, and you insert that pipeline through an admin interface. Um, the core then spins up all of these stages in, in JVMs or what have you. Right now we only have support for Java, but that can change. Um, and they communicate through the core via REST, which also means that you can actually query the core yourself from your IDE and see what the actual documents are looking like for this stage right now that you're developing or what's going to happen. Um, also, this means that we can just spin up more cores um, side by side and connect to the same MongoDB instance. Uh, the MongoDB instance doesn't only serve the stages, it also serves, serves the documents. So documents enter MongoDB, it's used as sort of like a buffer. Um, and we have kind of multiple writers, multiple readers. Um, and um, when processed, they will be removed out of buffer, obviously. Um, yeah, um, so you can come to this uh, conference here without uh, talking about Hadoop or big data, right? Um, so, so we've created this system now where we have uh, something that works well on small scale, but also on large scale. Um, Assuming MongoDB scales to large scale, but that's a whole other thing. Um, there's, of course, some other ways of doing this, uh, specifically using Hadoop or MapReduce. Um, the best known use case for search is to do, of course, PageRank, uh, which is what began all of this in the first place, um, and uh, other analytics. Um, of course, MapReduce is batch processing, which means that you would sacrifice hugely in terms of time to index from the source system into the search engine uh, if you were to do only MapReduce operations to uh, do your entire processing. Um, and um, it doesn't really suit itself to, to times where you don't have, but MapReduce works well when you have the entire document set. It doesn't work that well for continuous uh, um, processing. Um, so obviously there's advantages to MapReduce and there's disadvantages. Um, so we tried to think about how can we how can we do this, and that's what we came up with. Um, since all of the stages will have their requirements coded into them, what <coughs> configured rather, what is the prerequisite for me to do my my work? Um, we can easily set up different forks to do different things. Um, in this way, we can set up here, uh, we have the blue flow, which is when you, when something enters the system from the left, it goes through the blue um, flow of uh, stages, 
um, and the purple flow. Uh, and you see that one of the stages in the blue flow actually exports, some, exports the document into an HBase uh, instance. Then you do some MapReduce calculations on that. Um, perhaps you uh, calculate page rank for all your documents, which is a pretty neat thing to have in search. Uh, and then it basically gets reinserted into the pipeline. Within the same pipeline, you will have a couple of stages that act only on the documents that already have page rank. Uh, and then still have the purple ones export the thing to the search engine as you normally have. Um, in this way, we can have both the time to index of the uh, real time processing and the advantages of uh, batch processing that map produce in, in the two offers. Um, there's, uh, we, we started doing this. Um, we, had a, we had the idea of the thesis workers, they're excellent. Uh, you can have, come, have them come in and do things that you don't want to do. So we had someone come in and do interaction design for us um, and design the, uh, the admin interface for, for, for Hydro. Actually, this hasn't been implemented yet, but it, this still exists. And this tried to, uh, to visualize how uh, a pipeline would look where you can have forks and uh, things happening <coughs> concurrently in different places. So it's fine to be easy to work with. Um, that's uh, sort of in the pipeline for, for our next uh, version. Um, but yeah, we're, we're open sourcing this. Um, we want to continue developing Hydro. We're going to be using it at our customers. Um, it's beyond us why there hasn't been a good uh, open source community around processing, or let's not say processing, let's say document processing for search, uh, until, uh, well, it just doesn't exist. Um, why is everyone writing the same operations, just configuring them in different ways for different uh, use cases? Uh, why aren't we helping each other do this and just be more effective and actually do the things that are important, such as extracting the actual information or uh, providing the business value with our search. Uh, so a lot of the times we spend a lot of time on writing these basic uh, processing stages. Everyone does this in search. Um, let's not. Uh, let's help each other. Uh, so we're open sourcing the framework and a lot of the basic processing stages that we have. Uh, we're going to continue using it. We have it in production at a couple of customers. Um, and we're going to be continuing using it and updating it and, uh, and contributing more to the open source, uh, uh, to, the, to the source code. Um, but I invite you all, if you're interested in these topics surrounding document processing, um, surrounding uh, search, uh, um, enhancing search or, or whatever, just get in touch with us and help out. Um, we can't we can't have a community, an open source community, based around just the one company. Um, we we really want external committers and people who want to help out because that's how we get the most value out of this and how we get um, the most use out of Python uh, in general. Um, so you can find the source code on, on GitHub. Um, the the URL is right there. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. Are there any questions? <laughs> yeah, I have two questions. First question, um, the license of Hydra, is it something like Apache license? Yeah, so uh, the license is Apache to Okay. Yeah. And the second question, did you think about using the MongoDB to permanently store the documents? Yes. Uh, right now, we're dropping documents just because it. Uh, I, you can either drop documents or just store them in uh, a separate collection. You don't want to store them in the working for obvious reasons um, because it kind of diminishes the effectiveness of, uh, of the buffer because it has to deal with a lot more data. But you can, of course, store the documents permanently in MongoDB. And actually, we're doing that. We have a caching layer, usually, where we store all documents in MongoDB first, then process them with um, Hydro. So, so yeah, you can use that and, of course, do 
not producing MongoDB if you want to do that or or whatever your your use case might be. I just think it, it might make sense because um, you spend a lot of um, resources uh, when converting documents and doing any entity recognition and stuff like that. And just in case um, you want to re-index all the stuff, you shouldn't uh, need to to do the analysis again. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Any more questions? <laughs> How do you typically uh, transform a document uh, into data to be entered in the free text? Um, so that depends on, on what the type of document is. I mean, for us, in, in, in search at least, uh, every piece of information object available is a document, because that's the sort of syntax of, uh, of Lucene and, and other things. Um, Typically, we uh, we use if it's a P, if we're talking about binary data, is that it? Or? No, it's more. Uh, it, is it a uh, is it a programming interface, or do we have a, a more high level extraction layer on top of it? And they should say, okay, uh, uh, this is the way uh, uh, how you could extract a part of a document. Or yeah. So so usually what we do is we do some sort of information analysis, right? Because you have to understand what the, the information actually looks like. Um, and then you have, in Hydra, you configure your stages to do whatever it is you want to do. So, for instance, for headline extraction, say from, uh, from PDF documents or, or something like that, you usually start by using Tika for parsing, and then use uh, uh, some of the other processing stages to, to perform the action that you actually are after. Uh, so we can see the stages as sort of the operators of the, the Hydra uh, language. So, so to speak, you just have to put them in the right order and configure them to do what it is you want to do. Can I ask a second question? Okay. Um, uh, it's completely different. Um, <coughs> like it, uh, like during the stages. Uh, uh, how do you deal with that? Do you have to do the scene chart or handling uh, different languages? Um, yes, I'm sorry, was the question how do we handle different languages for say check the extraction and stuff like that? Um, so what we usually do is we start off, off by doing a language detection. Um, entity extraction for a few languages are a solved problem at FindWise, uh, not all languages. Uh, so obviously you do a, you have a processing stage in Hydra for English entity extraction, which only acts on documents that have the English uh, uh, language as uh, something that's been added by another stage. So you try to separate the two, basically. Um, if you have Swedish uh, entity extraction, you only act on documents that you know are in Swedish. Yeah, but also on the index side. <coughs> For the on the index side, I'm not sure really what you mean. Sorry. Are uh, uh, Swedish documents indexed in a different machine index than the other ones? Um, yeah. So the, okay. So yeah, that's a complex question. It depends on your. Uh, it depends on the business uh, case. Often, uh, sometimes it makes a lot of sense to have a single, um, uh, to have a single Lucene index for everything. But then you obviously have to deal with how do you do uh, the the query processing and the, and that sort of thing. Um, Sometimes we end up with different indices. Sometimes we end up with the same index and, and different query processors because we usually use we have our own middle layer in front of the actual query parser for whatever search engine that might be. So we can solve that in there. Uh, we basically query different fields based on the language of the user doing the query or stuff like that. Thanks. Any more questions? And I have a question about language detection, um, how you are doing that, and what you are doing with the documents for which you cannot predict the language, or you are not sure uh, which language is. Um, so, with language detection, it, it's not, to be honest, it's not really my field, but we usually use uh, trigrams. Um, and with trigrams and a decent, tra decently trained trigram uh, analyzer, you usually end up with you can fairly predictably 
say, the language of most documents. Uh, if you're dealing with uh, things like Twitter, if that's your document set, uh, then you have a whole other problem, because not only do you have to deal with English and Swedish and Russian and whatever in a multitude of uh, <coughs> and in a multitude of different languages uh, in just 140 characters, but you also end up with the problem of social speak. Uh, Twitterese is different from English um, and uh, stuff like that. But for larger documents, say uh, beyond uh, maybe a hundred words, uh, trigrams are almost entirely accurate. Anyone else? <laughs> um, does this thing scale on multiple computers, or is it basically the only thing that scales on a network? Oh. So, so it, it, it scales. Um, it's based around MongoDB, which you obviously you can scale as you want, and you can shard the basically you can. Sh <coughs> The documents enter MongoDB, right? You can shard MongoDB to accept documents um, in, in many different shards. Um, so basically, you will have a situation where you have the Hydra core. We can go back to that slide, actually. Um, the Hydra core connected to the MongoDB cloud, um, which um, obviously you can do that locally, or you can just do that. You connect with the shard master and then uh, do that uh, the whole thing. Um, so you can you can connect many cores to Mongo, and Mongo can scale horizontally uh, with sharding. Uh, but the CPU time does does it scale on multiple computers? Because the NLP guys usually use some parsers and such stuff. That we okay. So 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 I answered the question: Does the framework scale? Which is yes. Uh, the question of whether processing stages scale. Um, of course they scale uh, if you throw enough computers at them. Um, it depends on what you want to do. Uh, in a lot of cases, uh, you might not want to do entity extraction. That might be... Uh, a lot of people start talking about that early on, but they implement it after, you know, five years or something. It depends on what the use case is. Um, and that you might have a problem, problem scaling. But I know customers who do entity extraction and uh, language detection sentiment analysis on on 60, 70 million documents a day. Um, so so it, it, it all depends. Uh, you could all, of course, you just you know, do NLP as a service uh, and have that solve the problem. Okay, thanks for joining and enjoy the lunch.